Hey humans, how's it going? Susan Ruth here. Thanks for listening to another episode of Hey Human Podcast. This is episode 320, and I had a conversation with Rachel Rantman. It's our second of two conversations. The first one was on episode 317. The first one was more about her life's journey up until uh, where the second one takes over, which makes sense, I suppose. The second episode in this two-part series is called The Road to Ayahuasca, and she talks about her her turning inward and, and discovering her holistic self and her consciousness self and how she explored that in conjunction with her healing through addiction. Really great conversation. Rachel's a friend of mine, so that's always really fun. Definitely, if you haven't had a chance to hear episode 317, I highly recommend it. It doesn't really matter which order you listen to them in. So if you're here and you're listening, you know, listen to this one and then you can go back and see what led to this one. Or, you know, if you listen to the other one, now you get to hear the next phase of her journey. Thank you to everyone who subscribed to the Are We There Yet podcast show. We are now officially on YouTube as, drumroll, youtube.com, Are We There Yet podcast show. Check it out. Go there. Subscribe. Comment. Like stuff. Do the things. Six episodes so far. They come out every two weeks. And it's a sex and relationships podcast show video thing. (laughs) Y'all really showed up and and subscribed, and I appreciate that. Thank you so much for that. In other news, Hey Human Podcast can be found on social media under, surprise, surprise, Hey Human Podcast on Instagram and Facebook. You can find my personal social media, Susan Ruthism, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. You can email me, susan at heyhumanpodcast.com. If you go to the official website, heyhumanpodcast.com, you'll find all sorts of stuff. You'll find the links page where every guest gets a little pile of links about whatever we talked about in that episode. You'll find the storefront where you can get Hey Human merch, a great way to support the show and help keep it ad-free. You'll find the contribute button, a great way to be in partnership with Hey Human and help keep her going. Uh, and you will also find all of the episodes of the show. So if you're on your podcast apps and you look and you say, wait, how come only X amount of shows are showing? Their algorithms are set up so that you only get 300 at a time. But on heyhumanpodcast.com, you can get every episode. They're all there. And uh, it's a one-stop shop, as it were. If you want to check out other stuff I do, go to susanruth.com and there'll be things about music and art and any acting thing I might do, interviews with me, and you can also sign up on the mailing list there. And I don't send out very many mailers, so you won't be over inundated. So that's susanruth.com. You can check out my YouTube channel that is different than the Sex and Relationship Show, just my personal YouTube channel, which is Official Susan Ruth. And I know there's just, there's so much out there on the internet, isn't there? Rate and review and subscribe to Hey Human on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And I think that's pretty much all I've got to say about that for the usual stuff. Let's just get right into the episode. Thanks for listening. Be safe out there. Uh, the, all the variants are going crazy and just, uh, you know, take care of yourselves and take precautions and... Be kind to each other, be loving, stay safe, and thank you for being here with me. All right, let's do this. Here we go. Rachel Revin, welcome to Hey Human for a second time. Thank you. It's good to have you back. Thank you. It's good to be back. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Happy 4th of July. Happy day Is after 4th of July. <laughs> Um, it was tricky this year. I, I feel yeah. that that very strong s- sentiment that none of us are free unless all of us are free. And, mm-hmm. you know, as we watch the government have a tighter grip on our liberties and our freedoms and our choices, it it's a real bummer, you know? I can definitely understand that. Someone whistling? Only serial killers whistle. Someone <laughs> is absolutely whistling. I think we might want to... <laughs> I think if I was going to be a serial killer, I would definitely pick up whistling. 
I feel like that is one of the scarier precursors to being the dead. There's yeah. a lot of There's life. a lot of ambient noise. This is why in my old place when I had built my podcast studio, it was great. And now in this apartment or, you know, this house, whatever I'm in. It's an need, apartment house, you, you know. You need to what? Drop down. Drop down. You need to have some roll up. There you roll go. Roll up foam and like roll it out. And you guys don't know how it would be in here though if I did that. Well, if we like encased us like a, the cone of silence. That's what we need. Yeah. We need the cone of silence. It would be hot. It would be hot. Yeah. Broiling it hot. It would be broiling hot. Because now I sit in my closet with all my clothes and I just put a blanket up and I feel silly because the people I'm interviewing thinking... Are you in a closet right now? Oh, you, but you're it's, saying when you do it online with people, yes, you sit in I that sit closet? I sit in that closet. Mm-hmm. Oh. Which is, it's great for deadening the sound. There's just no good place in this apartment. And I I can't really, it costs money to rent studio space. Of course. Of so, course. Of anyway, course. enough about that. Hi. Hi. Good to see you again. Thank I've you. I've got to tell you, I have received so many lovely comments about your episode. Really? Yeah. Aww, really I'm lovely. So People were uh, moved and inspired and and I think I think it really touched a, a lot of people on a lot of levels. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean so that's good. that's the goal, right? The goal that's is the dream. to get out there and see if we can, you know, shake things up a little bit, reach inside of people, tap a spot. We've got millions of spots, billions of spots, infinite spots to tap. Mm. So just got to get on in there. Well, let's pick up where we left off. Last we heard from you. Last we heard. Where did we leave off? We left off so with you on. kicking the habit that yeah. you had for 15 years. And yes. you were uh, getting ready to move, I believe. Or you'd already moved to L.A. No, you had not. You were still no, in New that York. Was, that was, that's, that's a little down the road. It's a little down the road. If we're back where things are being being kicked and... I'm working through all of that. Then we're we're on the road to ayahuasca. You were on episode 317, the first part of your story, and you were getting clean and getting ready because you really wanted to do this ayahuasca journey. So let's let's go to that spot. Yeah. Yeah. So so we had talked about how yes, I had been on I'd been on just oodles of opiates for the better part of 15 years and I had heard of ayahuasca many, many years ago, but but I, I couldn't do it until I was not taking all these drugs. And so somewhere, you know, it filtered out, and then 10 years later, it came back onto my radar, and I was still on all these drugs. And then somewhere, somewhere though, it planted a seed. And that's kind of how it works, right? Like, it shows up, and it'll just sort of plant a seed. And that seed might take quite a while to, to grow. And I had to do a lot of work. I had to, you know, not only getting off all the opiates, but then getting off all of the all of the drugs that you get put on to get off of the opiates and getting off all those and then as as a as a drug addict I then went and found ways to just do other drugs because my body wasn't working very well after 15 years of um of extensive of extensive opiate use so I I just I had to go through I don't know it feels like 87 different new drug withdrawals but it was probably like 10 let's say, which is a lot of drug withdrawals to keep I believe doing. your I mean, term was oodles of opiates. <laughs> which, oodles of opiates. Which is a great band name, by the way. Oh, yes, that is a great band name. I have a couple, I'll tell you later, I have a couple of other really good band names that I've come up with over the years. You know what, I'll just tell everybody. One of them, you can. T- you know what, if you want to take it and you want to take my band name, anybody out there listening, I, I will support you. Just let me know and maybe credit me. But badass pedestrian is one of them. It's a good one. Yeah, because I'm a pretty I'm a pretty righteous street crosser, you know. And um, oh, tit robot. That was the other one. I like that. So I was having a conversation with my with my friend, and I was just, I was actually going off about this this guy I knew, and 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 it's and it, kind of just the way that he treats women. And I'm like, am I just supposed to be some? Big tit robot, you know. What I just said she was like, "Oh my god, tit robot." It's a great That's name. Another great band name. Yeah. So we're just we're just kicking. That them might out. have to be the name of the episode. Tit robot. Why not? I don't know about that. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see if tit robot and ayahuasca end up dovetailing somehow. We'll see how it plays out. So, ayahuasca dovetail, also a good name for a band. Ayahuasca dovetail. Ayahuasca dovetail. I mean, ayahuasca is really good with so many things. I feel like we could. 
we can on pizza play that or one or <laughs> yeah yeah just, just you know squeeze a little ayahuasca on your pizza and see where you go no i actually for everybody listening i would not combine ayahuasca and pizza that will we will discuss that that is a no go that's a no go <laughs> the no go ayahuasca and pizza so after all the drug withdrawals it was really it was really in service of getting to ayahuasca and so i had this i had this um this not vision but this place this place that I was going to go and it's called so where I first went and drank ayahuasca it's called Rhythmia and Rhythmia is a really well-known ayahuasca retreat um and there's a couple of other ones Rhythmia is in Costa Rica so it's important to point out that ayahuasca is not legal in the United States and one must generally travel to another country where it is legal and most many ayahuasca retreats are going to be in um in Costa Rica and then of course the native countries for ayahuasca. So you've got Colombia, Peru, Ecuador, Brazil. And actually the Church of Santo Diame, which is a religious institution, which is here in the United States, they actually can legally serve ayahuasca. So there there are select places in the United States that can legally serve ayahuasca as a sacrament. But overall, besides that, it is not legal. Um, so I, I had heard about Rhythmia from a friend of a friend and it and it became a place that was was uh, it, it it called to me, and it is, you know, it's it's certainly considered one of these a little bit more. Sometimes people call them like the kind of celebrity ayahuasca retreats, and for me, for me, it was really important. Well, first of all, I didn't have connections in this world. I mean, I knew a couple people maybe who served, but I, I just I wasn't in a place to go to some random place with random people that I just had no knowledge of. I I really wanted to go someplace, given my medical history, that was going to be really on top of me medically. And Rhythmia or any of these places, you know, because they're concerned, I think first and foremost, but certainly for liability reasons, need to make sure that you are medically fit to be drinking this medicine. And so I had a lot of, and they designed the program for you. You know, you just... You get a flight, you get picked up, you go to the place, mm. they take you back to the airport and you go home. So it wasn't something where I had to figure out how to get into the middle of nowhere in Peru, which I just didn't have, honestly, the bandwidth for at that point. I don't have the bandwidth to do it now, but at that point, I barely could get myself on the plane to Costa Rica. And it was, you know, kind of to the, there was there was sort of a schedule for two, for like drugs and medications that you couldn't take. You know, this and one had foods, to be- foods, right? Yeah, so the food is a whole, the, the dieta is a whole, is a whole thing. Um, That's the diet. Yeah, the diet. Uh, and everybody's diets are a little different. Everybody's going to tell you, omit this food or this food's okay. But generally speaking, going into ayahuasca for at least a week, but really two weeks, and really if you can do three or a month, I mean, as much preparation as you can, you want to be eating super clean, unprocessed fruits, vegetables, you know, clean grains, clean legumes. Um, you can have no no beef, no pork, but you could have some like organic, maybe a little or- organic chicken, organic turkey, wild caught fish. You want to limit limit your fats. You know, not that you can't have any. Um, and then some people specific foods like mushrooms, spinach, avocado might get omitted due to certain um, mm. like certain nutrients that they're heavy in that might potentially interact. That's pretty granular, but overall it's just a very healthy, very clean, very um, just stomach friendly uh, way of eating before you go into these medicines because you want to clean up your vessel. The less the medicine has to move through a bunch of processed food and chemicals and, you know, I don't know, cured meat and whatever, the less it has to deal with that, the better. Don't eat a Whopper before you go into an extent. Oh, Siri. Oh, Siri. Siri She's like, I don't understand. What do you mean? What do you mean? No Cheetos? (laughs) No Cheetos? No (laughs) Whoppas? Plus, I have British man Siri. Oh, yeah. I have British man Siri, too. Oh, oh, that's so great. Yeah. It just sounds so nice. I like British, the British man voice giving me directions me and too. also his mispronunciations of things crack me up that's why i like it too yeah it's I just love a little it. joy in my life i know yeah. and he says some of these words around here so so, so funny. funny it's mm. the best mm-hmm. oh i love it that's so great oh look we, we've discovered another little thing we love british man siri and his mispronunciation of it. the streets <laughs> around here um but yeah you you have to eat really clean yeah i mean we, you have to 
you want to eat really clean. You want to prepare yourself on so many levels. I mean, mentally, spiritually, yeah. nutritionally, physically. There's there's so much preparation to go in. It's it's a big deal to to drink these medicines. It's a big deal to undertake ceremonies and and you know engage with entheogens. These you know ayahuasca, iboga, psilocybin, which is you know mushrooms. Um, mescaline cactus, which is San Pedro or peyote, even, um, you know, and then you have LSD, you have MDMA, you have ketamine. DMT. DMT is that, yeah, that's an active ingredient too in, in ayahuasca, or at least I should say it's not the, it's the, it's the ingredient that leads to the visions and, and the, you know, and the the visionary states typically. It's the chemical that's released in us. When we're born and when we die. Yeah, it's also it's also what what our brain floods when we have near death experiences. So when you you know people talk about people talk about um, you know having a near death experience and then they're floating about their body and then they can see kind of their entire lifespan or they can go into all of these different kind of places and realms or they get or they go and they they see God or whatever one's conception of God or name for God or name for you know source is they see source and they travel to source and then they travel back. All of that is very, is very, you know, ayahuasca. Because I saw Top Gun too when I died. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was such a wonderful it's movie. So good. It's such a wonderful movie. <laughs> oh, I mean, I don't know if I'll ever see it as many times as I've seen Top Gun, the, the first one, because I've seen it 300 times because right. I obsessively watched it as a child. <laughs> oh, and I just, I learned so many things. I learned the fun of the fun of going fast and I learned to love motorcycles and you I mean the need for speed the need for speed I feel the need the need for speed yeah oh and all of those all of those good looking emotionally unavailable men I mean it just primed me for a really successful I mean, life yeah <laughs> they're always so slippery I loved it oh they're so slippery <laughs> slippery is this is a word I use too slippery I'm like oh you're so slippery they're slick slip. and muscly. Yeah. Any whoosies. God bless this sexual awakening. Any, anyway, let's continue on. <laughs> God bless Top Gun and Top Gun Maverick. So, so we made it. We made it to Costa Rica. We made it to Costa Rica. Me, myself, and I. And it was, you know, I I knew, I knew ayahuasca. I and I intuitively knew that ayahuasca was going to be like a big life changing thing for me. I didn't really know why. I also did not do a bunch of research on it. I don't want to do it. I no. mean, I, I, I want to do ayahuasca. I don't want to do a bunch of research beforehand because I don't want to taint my experience. Right. right. And, and, you know, I got there and so many people are like, yeah, I watched like all these videos and did all this. And I'm like, I did not do any of that because, because one of the, if you do watch any of these videos, one of the hopefully things that it says is this is an extremely unique experience yeah. and it will only be your experience <laughs> and only... Only you will have this experience. Right. In the same way that only you are you, in the same way that your DNA is unique to you. So other people, someone might talk about this concept or that concept, and you may or may not experience that because it may or may not be part of your, you know, your journey. So I I definitely didn't want to get a whole bunch of other people's stories that may or may not have anything to do with mine. There are certainly some themes that I would say now having had, you know, enough medicine experience to be able to speak on it to you know i'm not an expert i'm just a i'm just someone who's experienced it but um there are themes how many yeah how many journeys have you taken i've i've sat with ayahuasca about 20 times that's a lot yeah i mean yes i do i I, it, it is a lot it's a lot i think that i think that people i think i think most people probably sit with it or sit with it a few times and are like, okay. <laughs> Instead know? of talking about your experience in it as far as like what you saw or, yeah. or what it said to you or how it spoke to you in your body, I'm curious to know how it helped you. Yeah, yeah. And I wasn't going to spend too much time or any even talking about what I saw specifically, maybe to make some references for bigger points because we could sit here for 20 hours while I tell you the immense amazing things that I've seen in ayahuasca. Um, and I've, you know, I've sat with, I've sat with San Pedro and I've sat in large dose psilocybin uh, ceremonies and I've, I've worked with combo a lot and combo, combo is an incredible medicine that we should, that we can, you know, we can talk about maybe a little the bit The frog later. one. The, yeah, yeah, that's, the, there's the frog and then there's the toad, which is a different DMT related uh, medicine. And 
so so one of the things so ayahuasca so my my first ceremony i mean we went right into the heart of things right so i'm i'm i feel so fortunate that that when i'm in ceremony and now when i'm out of ceremony i have really direct communication with source and i and i do refer to it as god and other people might say source great spirit mama gaia whatever it is for you it could be jesus it could be allah they're all they're all referencing some similar some similar uh guideposts in in my opinion same my and, opinion too i mean yeah i feel like it's all connected it's all the same energy yeah yeah yeah, it is. It is. And we can have our different names. And we can Absolutely. have our different interpretations. Also, it doesn't matter. It, it, at the end of the day, my friend Ellen's favorite expression, it, it doesn't make a difference. As long as you are in touch with a particular feeling or not. It doesn't matter if you're not in touch with that particular feeling. This is my issue with the human race, is that we're so desperately trying to make everybody else think exactly like us instead of acknowledging the beauty of the differences Mm -hmm. and how lovely they all are Mm -hmm. i feel that way too yeah and you know god loves differences god loves differences that's why that's why we're different if if we were meant to all be the same then we simply would be Mm. source loves differences the planet needs differences so to honor all of that is is absolutely the best way to go in my opinion I'm going to just say that all the time, in my opinion, so everyone knows. It's the only opinion you have. It's your it's own. My only reference point yes. is this one right here. That's it, baby. Um, so, wait, what was the question now that we talked all we about? We were talking about how it shaped you after the fact. Yeah, yeah. So I, so I immediately was really connected with Source. I was really able to, to, see, to see into my own life trajectory, like even back to the start, how I was even conceived what that looked like. I don't mean like my parents, but just the feelings of it, what was going on. I was able to really kind of see some things that I carry. I was able to get so much insight into my parents, into who they are. And I might've said this on the last, on the last um, episode, but I've had these moments in the medicine where it's like, I I see their whole life in in one second. I can Mm -hmm. see their entire life in a flash. And it just generates this beyond what I can describe level of love and compassion for who they are, for what they've seen, for where they've been, and for how they contributed to me and to, and to who I am. And, and all of that said, of course, with all their pain and with what I took on of their pain and with my own pain, all of that, it all gets, it all gets, um, just, it just turns into this ball of compassion and this beautiful ball of love how do you process that in the moment when you're receiving so much is it going into you in a cellular level do you think or is it your mind that's taking it in and then processing it to the rest of you so in those moments where where you for example can see your parents life in an instant that that very much surpasses the mind right like that's just that's just feeling that's just cellular that's just somatic it's just this beautiful it's this beautiful level of feeling it's actually really contrary in a number of ways to the way i think most of us go through our waking life which is analyzing every detail and trying to figure it all out and make a mental picture and you know at least for me having been so trained to have my mind be front and center those those are the moments it's it's almost it's almost like all of life hits you like a dart was just thrown at a bullseye and all of life just pours into you in this like split second where you have this 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 level of of compassion and empathy and depth and love and forgiveness forgiveness is a huge one Mm -hmm. because i feel that the amount of forgiveness that has been generated by being able to drop all the walls because you're because you're no longer in that space of well this happened and that happened and they said this and somebody did this and then everybody did this and then my whole childhood was this all of that's gone all of that's gone because at the end of the day it's irrelevant and and you just feel you just get to feel 
And if you're somebody who has spent most of your life trying not to feel because feeling was too painful or too hard, it, you know, it's, it's a lot, but it's extremely beautiful. It's extremely beautiful. Um, there was a lot of, I'd say there's also been reconciliation, right? Reconciliation within my own self of fragmented, broken pieces, just being able to come back together. And I, I mean that on a, on like on a heart level. So feeling as if, not that my heart was broken, but almost, almost like parts of it were missing mm. and they were able to come back. And a lot of that speaks to, speaks to self-love and speaks to being able to, or at least take the journey to work on self-love. Um, and there are people in, in the, the place that you went to that could help you when you came out of each experience to help you process? Or are they just there for medical assistance? Or? Oh, there's lots of people there to help you process, yeah. to, to provide whatever you need. Um, I'm, I've never, in the aftermath of any ceremony, necessarily required tons of processing. I've certainly had ceremonies where I've ended up talking to, let's say, one of the facilitators, which sometimes it's a shaman, sometimes it's a medicine carrier. They, you know, it's different. Shamans really indicate a shaman serves ayahuasca, a medicine carrier serves ayahuasca. A shaman typically indicates a lineage, you know, like a sacred lineage from a specific tribe that is, you know, from Amazon and, and related areas. Whereas, say, someone else I know who, ha- who serves medicine, they might refer to themselves as a medicine carrier because for all of their ex- incredible, you know, depth of experience and ability to serve on a completely wonderful, next level, beautiful, um, beautiful way, they're not shamans. They're not technically shamans. Um, so you have you have them, the people actually serving, the people who you know brew and serve the medicine, um, and then you have a lot of like helpers too in the room. You have various. Some people call them guardians, some people call them helpers, whatever they are, they're people that are there. They're also there for while you're in the medicine because when you're in the medicine, a lot of things can happen. So I've had many experiences where I very much needed help going to the bathroom because sometimes the, I, I think it's, I would imagine it's a DMT, you can feel almost pinned down like you can't get up. Not that you're trapped, not that you really can't get up, but for that stretch of time and it passes, Maybe you're just, you're, or you're too unsteady on your feet, or you're just deep, deep in the medicine, and you need help, so you have to ask for help. I've had a lot of lessons about asking for help in the medicine. Like, Rachel, you need to learn to ask for help, so we are going to pin you to the floor, and then you're going to have to say the word help out loud, and other people will hear it. Other people, yeah, other people hear, but nobody's, nobody notices, you know? I mean, how people many are in pe- their own journeys. Yeah, I was going to say, how many people are in a room doing their own medicine, so, I mean, I've, I've sat, I've been in a private ceremony where there were five of us, and I've been in a large ceremony at Rhythmia where they, they have got like 75, 80 people. Wow. Yeah, in a huge, huge temple, like a huge, huge, huge space. So, and then I've been in, in between, you know, I've been in ceremonies where there's in the 20s and the 30s and the 50s, whatever. Wow. Yeah. So it's really, it's a really, um, there are many different ways to do it. There's not one way to do it. And... One of the things that is really important to say, especially as someone who came from from addiction, is that in my first and and also my second ceremony. So when I went to Rhythmia, I drank four four times in a row. I drank I drank ayahuasca on a Monday night, on a Tuesday night, on a Wednesday night, and on a Thursday night. And in that first ceremony, it was the half the ceremony was spent like rewiring my brain. And I knew what was going on. I was like, oh, the little minions are going up behind the supercomputer and they are reconnecting all the frayed wires that the last 15 years disconnected and cut and short circuited. And I knew it. And it was really wild because and I could I could I could feel it. I was like, wow. And I mean, since then, like I haven't I haven't wanted to touch. I just haven't wanted to touch opiates. Or other certain other things too. I've heard that it has been extraordinarily helpful in addiction, to helping people to quit. That people quit cigarettes, quit drugs, quit alcohol, just cold turkey. Yeah, I think that that can happen. Um, I think that that can happen and has happened for sure. It's also important though to say that, as we spoke about 
I did a ton of preparation to get to that point, right? So I always want to make sure that the idea that I've got this big thing going on, I've got this big addiction on my hands, I'll just go drink ayahuasca and the ayahuasca will fix it, that that is not, not how it works. Um, it's, I, I like to say that the medicine rises to meet you. So if, if, you're, if you're putting in the work and you're making your best effort, the medicine will rise and meet you at that best effort. If it's a I- very intentional experience. You can't just go willy-nilly into it, is what you're saying, I think. Well, you can't just go willy-nilly into it, but, but it's, not, it's not there to fix, to fix your issues, is, is what I'm trying to say. So, so sometimes, sometimes we think, like, oh, I'm going to do this thing. And then, like, my problems are going to disappear. Huh. And I'm just saying that is not how it works. Or, but that's the American way. <laughs> I know, but that's the dream. I'm just going to take this pill and everything's going to be better. Wait, no, that's not quite how it works. You know, so I, I just, I want to make sure that I put that out there. Sure. Because I, I think that that can, that can become a misconception that people have, that it will just fix everything. It will, it will work with you alongside your own hard work and also alongside preparation and then alongside integration. And I would be remiss if I didn't speak about integration. And integration is just referencing what you mentioned earlier, which is that a lot of stuff comes up. Are there people there to, you said, are there people there to talk to you afterwards? Are there people there to, but do you have support, whether it's, you know, people, programs, whatever it is in the weeks after, in the months after? I mean, it's a, it's a, like anything, like anything that's going to change your life or potentially change your life, it's a long process. And integration, I, I, it's, I mean, dare I say more important than the ayahuasca itself. It's more important because, because if you're going to go and have a peak experience, well, if, if you're not going to do something with it or process it or look at it, then in a way, what was the point? And I would never say, well, what's the point of drinking ayahuasca? There's always going to be a point. But th- I imagine that, that damaging things could even happen if someone goes and looks at so many things and doesn't have any support after. In the same way that going through rehab, for example, and then just being chucked out on the street like good you've been you've been rehabilitated 30 days see you later that doesn't work either Mm-mm. it doesn't work you need you need you know intensive outpatient and then you need follow-up counseling and then you need support groups and then you need because any process that's big requires a lot of integration and it's also a lot to see some of the things that you see i mean for me i got to learn a lot about about my childhood in different more more somatic, more heart-centered, more feeling ways, but that was a lot to deal with. It was just, it was a lot, you know? I got to see, I remember my, my fifth ceremony, I spent most of that time, like, in my own, in my own experience being inside of my mom during gestation, and that was wild. I had to, you know, I had to really sit with that and work with that and talk about it and, you know, all that, so... Um, so there's a there's a lot that that one might see, and someone else might go in and like just see a bunch of colors. I, I don't know. I don't know what other people's experiences necessarily are. I do know that you know it's it's profound, and like I said, when you when you do the work to really come to it, the medicine will come to meet you. So I I know that we we're living in a time where psychedelics are really they've become you know popular, and they're almost it's almost like an Instagram thing, and Sometimes I think, gosh, you know, do people have like the psychedelic checklist, like ayahuasca, check, you know, psilocybin ceremony, check, LSD, check, you know, combo, check, uh, whatever, bufo, check, all of it. What's that one? A bu- that's the one. It's, it's medicine from a toad. It's also oh. DMT. It's a specific type of DMT called 5-MeO-DMT. And, um, you know, Is that's... Is that why toads always look like they're smiling? <laughs> <laughs> Could be. They just have like a whole. They're just constantly they're just out of their minds. They're out of their constantly. minds. Love it. <laughs> yeah. So you know, are people just checking the boxes, or, I mean, is it a? It is a yo, bro. Let's drink ayahuasca. Saturday I think there night. is that. There is that. Of there is, there that. is that. But uh, hopefully, the intentionality is that a word? I don't know. That uh, the intentionality. There it is. That that is the thing that will drive most people, and not the. 
Hey bro, check off this list. What happens now? You got you you've done the event and you come back. Yeah. Um, how how does your life unfold for you at, after that experience? So I. I, I came I came back to New York City and I think one of the first things I, I was living in New York at the time and one of the first things I noticed I was like I really like New York a lot more and so I'd be walking along and it would be smelly and crowded and crazy and da 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 and I was like look at all these lovely people just doing their thing living their life yeah they're making some noise but I'm okay <laughs> so I I think I will I will always I will always look with such love and fondness upon those those initial months after first drinking ayahuasca. I have so much love for that. Because as with anything, as you continue, as you continue to dive into yourself, you know, the, the things get deeper and, and things get, as you go deeper, it can get murkier. And not in a bad way. It's not a judgment call. It's just the more you, the more you unpeel, the, the deeper and darker layers you can get to. And that's, and that's wonderful and that's beautiful. Um, but it's, it's not, it's, it's not the same as those moments right after when you have first really shined that light on your life and you are just so excited to be alive. Um, and I'm still very, very excited to be alive. It's just, it's just not that moment because that moment was three years ago and now it's another moment. Um, but it was, it was really wonderful and it, and I, after that is when I um, is when I went and did all my hypnosis certification to become a hypnotist, and then after that I I sat through another number of ceremonies, um, and then uh, and then the pandemic came, and I I just I oh, I I've never been more grateful than than I am for the timing of everything, like I imagine being in New York, in my little apartment with everything that unfolded there when March of 2020 just came slamming down on us. It was hard for New Yorkers, especially because the bodies were really piling up there. They were piling up in refrigerated storage containers outside of hospitals or wherever they were. It had to have been like doomsday walking around. It was. It was really really weird seeing the streets of New York empty. And it was the level of energy in the air, which I was super dialed into. In fact, I sat in a ceremony. I remember it. I sat in a ceremony. It was, it was Saturday night. It was like March 14th, Saturday night, March, I think it was 14th of 2020. And everything shut down that Monday, the 16th. I mean, I remember, and I remember that ceremony. I was kind of freaked out because everybody was already freaked out right? The president had already gone on TV, been like, we have a pandemic, whatever. Like, we were all on red alert. And I was like, well, I've signed up for this ceremony. And this seems like a good thing to do probably going into this. I was like, just prepare yourself. And it actually was, it was really, I remember interestingly about that ceremony, I was actually really physically kind of uncomfortable during it. It was very cold in the room that night, you know, March in New York, not so warm and and where we were doing it was not um you know it wasn't like a well insulated space per se and i was so i remember laying there i was just like i'm so grateful for my own apartment i'm so grateful for my warm apartment i'm so grateful for my bed i'm so grateful my apartment is a wonderful place and i had no idea that i was about to spend the next few months in that apartment so i actually the medicine always gives you what you need. And I look back on that. I mean, other things happened during that ceremony too. But I look back on that particular takeaway and I was like, always coming through for me. Always coming through for me, Ayahuasca. Thank you so much. Yeah. So it was pretty intense and, and I was very sensitive to it. I'm always pretty energetically sensitive. When you add in medicine work, you just open your channels more. And it was it was a pretty intense time to be in New York, and it definitely led to the beginnings, the beginnings of some evaluation as to whether that was the place for me to stay. I'm curious for a New Yorker who I imagine you heard in other parts of America people saying like, "Oh, New York's making things up. It's a big lie. There aren't really bodies being stacked up. They're not really losing thousands of people." You were there. Yeah, no, it was it was serious. Yeah, it was serious. It was very serious. Um, 
New York, New York gets things first, right? It's the, it's sort of the epicenter, biggest entry point for to the world. international travel yeah. and all of that that we have in the United States. So whatever's going to happen, you're going to see it happen there first. And it was a big deal. And it's really, you know, people's viewpoints on whether we needed to do this or that, or whether it was this or that, or all of that is sort of, again, the minutiae can become irrelevant. It was a really tough time. People, people were really struggling. You know, people were very much dying. I have, I have friends who lost relatives. I have one friend, he lost his aunt and he almost lost his dad. So that would have been two siblings that, you know, would have, would have died in the same, somehow his dad pulled through. Um, and I, you know, yeah. And one of, one of my really good friends, um, is a pathologist. So he was, he was, you know, he works in the, in the labs and in the hospitals in, in New York. And so he, he kind of knew about COVID before we did because he's already been seeing it. But I mean, I would talk to him about what was going on and he would tell me, he was like, this is, a, this is straight up so, so bad. So it really was, it was tough. And, and, and we all felt it because you could feel it in the air. It hung in the air, literally. And yeah, all those refrigerator trucks, you know, holding dead bodies, like it's true. That's what was happening. And in fact, last, let's see, last December, um, so maybe that was about a year and a half, a year and a half ago, December, I talked to my friend. He said they were still burying bodies from the prior June because he was also part of the, he would volunteer to do the burials. And what they did was they had to take bodies and like sink them down into New York Harbor to refrigerate them. And then they'd pull them up and bury them like in, you know, in, uh, in succession. Wow. So they were still in December, they were still burying bodies from six, from six months earlier. I mean, there was just, there was a lot to do. There was a lot that did transpire. And so, but it also gave you time or gave me time to think. And I think a number of people in New York, like, wow, living in a little box in a city like this, it's one thing when you have the life of New York. It's one thing when you have the theater and the restaurants and the museums and the opportunities and the this and the that. Once all that shuts down, what is your quality of life? How big was your apartment? Um, probably about 500 square feet. Yeah. So smaller than this one by about a hundred or by about ten square feet. Yeah, this is like a, it's, it's sim- probably this similar, is about similar size, or yeah, maybe a little smaller than this. Because this is an attic that was transformed. Yeah, you know, it was. It's not a lot of space when you have to be in it all the time. Right. It's totally fine. I had my apartment was great. You know, it was it was in a it was in a nice area. It was a doorman building. I'm up on a high floor, so I had a view. So at least stuck in that apartment, I got to look at the view. We had a roof deck in my building. They removed all the furniture, and so we would go up there and just like walk laps on the roof just to do something. Um, I would go up there and just listen to music and run in place, just anything to get out into the fresh air. But some days I just didn't want to be down on the streets. You know, not because not because of safety reasons, not because I was like, oh, I'm going to get COVID. It was just like, this is just like depressing. So I'm just going to go up on the roof and be higher, be closer to the clouds was really the thought. Um, but yeah, you, you spent a lot of time realizing that you don't have nature around you. And that that became just something that started to, it just started to, to kind of tick away at me. And I think that, you know, these these medicines like ayahuasca or psilocybin or any of these things, they, co- they connect you very much to nature and they connect you very much to yourself. And I think that those two things are actually somewhat the same. Um, but, but when you start to, when you start to dive back into your connection with nature, living in a place that has very little nature and nobody is going to talk me into Central Park being nature. I'm, I'm, you, you I could, love Central Park. I love it, but it's not <laughs> nature. It's some undeveloped swath of New York City. Um, but you can still you can still hear all the hustle and bustle even in the most isolated part of, of Central Park. So over the screams. Right over the screams and, you know, the ambulances. And there are a lot of ambulances at that point too. So um, it, I just started to evaluate a little bit more about and I thought, listen, I thought I was gonna be in New York forever. Obviously that's not true. Um, so it was, it was a time of, evalu- of evaluation. And when you get, you know, stuck in 500 square feet, you have some time to evaluate, some time to think. And 
work on yourself and, you know, do your integration. I was just like, all right, we're integrating. We're just going to integrate all this stuff, reach out to people, reach out to healers, reach out to resources, you know, practice my own resources, right? Practice the, I didn't have the phrase or the, the, yeah, the phrase uh, coined at that time, but energy of the redwood. I mean, I just thought of that, you know, more recently, but without knowing I was practicing, you know, the energy of the redwood, right? Being within oneself, being strong within oneself, being able to understand that one is part of community and also stand tall on one's own. So that was really good redwood energy practice. Yeah. Being on your own at that time. So you felt yourself being drawn to the West Coast. Yeah. So, so some other things I I ended up over the summer, I came and spent some time, you know, back in Portland and Seattle. And then I just, I decided, I was like, you know what, I need to not be in New York for the, for the winter. And my, my plan had been to return to New York. Um, but I was like, I just, I need to go other places for the winter. And so I gave up my apartment, packed up, left New York, went and stayed with a couple friends, spent some time in Mexico. Um, and then I ended up in, in DC for a little while, which was super random, but it was, but it was good. And it was in DC that, and this was last February. So almost a year and a half ago, um, that a friend of mine asked me, she said, you know, she said, where we were just having a conversation about what to do and next steps and wellness. And she said, where is your wellness best served? That was her question. You know, and the question wasn't, where do you have the most clients? Where do you think people most need you? The question was, where is your wellness best served? And immediately, intuitively, I was like back on the West Coast. It's just, it's like a voice that comes up from within. And so I, well, at first I was like, oh no. (laughs) Oh no, I heard that. I can't ignore that. Um, And it was kind of like, oh no, because I was, I was planning to go back to New York. I was already thinking, you know, oh, maybe I'll live in Brooklyn instead of the city, et cetera, et cetera. And it was just this huge redirect. And then I came out to um, I came out to LA to go to Joshua Tree to to sit in a retreat and to, and to sit with some medicine and ayahuasca again. Yes. Yeah. And I just when I was there, it just became more apparent that LA was the place the place I was meant to come. And then I was just walking around here, and it was as if the ocean put her hands into me and said you have to come live right next to me for your healing. And I said, well, all right, that seems like a pretty, a pretty direct, um, just a direct direction to follow. I received my marching orders. So that was, so I, so I moved out here last April. So a little over a year ago and I, I knew exactly what neighborhood to come live in. I, I just, I walked around. I, I knew I wanted to be, I knew I wanted to be by the water so I was like, okay, Venice, Santa Monica, you know, and I just, I, I, I triangulated into where I am and where we are. And it was, it was really though, it was the first time I've ever moved somewhere in my life that I've ever moved somewhere, like really following my purpose, really following what my intuition is telling me and what I know I'm meant to do. I feel like I've moved a lot, but it was always some version of or on a continuum of anything from I'm actually trying to maybe leave somewhere to well I don't know what to do let's see if this maybe works it was it was something in in that in that ballpark and this was this was the first time I really had a great um like positive forward momentum that felt really guided and it's interesting because LA is the last place I thought I would ever come back to because I because I lived here during some pretty rough months of and I think I referenced this in the last podcast of of all the drugs getting pretty out of control and I was I was like oh my god I'm gonna die in LA I'm gonna die in a West Hollywood apartment and I was like I'm never going back there like I'll go back there to visit if I have to but I'm never going back there and when it came time to come back I was like uh huh. Uh huh. Okay, I see. I see the. I see the kind of divine, you know, cycle of my returning to a place that held so much, um, just so much energy. I, I don't even want to call it negative energy, but held so much history, kind of his, like fear and loathing. I mean, right? Yeah. Like that fear and loathing. You know, I was almost like afraid of LA. I'm like, LA is a place where people go and die. You know, so. Um, 
yeah, I'm, it was, it was really interesting to end up back here, but here I am. And, um, and it's, it's, you know, it's been, it's been, of course, it's been sort of a bumpy road, but a beautiful road and, and roads are bumpy. That's kind of the nature of, of a road that we lay ourselves, Mm. right? I'm not a, I'm not a big, you know, I'm not a big, huge machine that lays flat concrete. I'm, I'm digging my own road, building my own road. So it's got some bumps. Um, but, but here I am, you know, and I, I do, I, you know, I continue to do medicine work. Um, although it's actually, it's been a little while since I've sat with ayahuasca and, and she's, she, she's really directed me to be in the here and now with myself without her. And it might sound funny to refer to her as a she, but it's a her. And the spirit of ayahuasca is very much, um, is very much feminine. Just, just like the spirit of psilocybin is, is generally considered more masculine. San Pedro too is considered like a grandfather medicine as opposed to ayahuasca, a grandmother medicine. For a lot of people, we have a voice in us Mm. pulling us one way or another. And we've talked about shadow and light, you and I, lots, yeah. a lot. And I think it's an interesting battle that takes place sometimes within. And, and I'm just considering what might have happened should you not have followed the light voice instead of the shadow. Like, and instead, what if you had followed the shadow voice? And I wonder if the light voice is inevitable for some people and shadow is inevitable for others. Meaning that you would have found your way into this spot regardless, even if it had taken you a few extra years. If it was always going to happen, I think about that stuff a lot. When I got here, for example, um, I would come here to write music, songwrite, and every time I touched down, it felt so grounded and so much like home, but I ignored that for about, I'd say four years, because mm-hmm. my fear was bigger than, than my desire to feel that grounded or, you know, to make that leap. Because, you know, I was well-rooted in Nashville, had a house, had friends, had, uh, you know, a, a, I would say um, a simplicity of knowing what's next. And so it was scary to just pack up everything. And it, the decision was made in such an interesting way. I can't remember if we talked about this on the last one, but it went like this. I finally one day woke up and thought, I'm going to sell my house and move to Los Angeles. Like, it just decided that. And that afternoon, my next door neighbor, Skylar, who's a dear friend, came over. And I said, Skylar, I think I might sell my house and move to Los Angeles. He's like, oh, wow. And I even started packing, even though I had no, I just started putting things away and started looking around like, oh, what, what can I get rid of? Got rid of a lot of stuff before I moved. The next day, Skylar knocks on my front door. I open it, and he says, I'm going to buy your house. So I spoke it, and within 24 hours, it was a reality. Right. And then all of a sudden, I was living in, after a very large garage sale, I was living in Los Angeles. And I spent, you know, two years over on the east side, and I really loved it. But when I got here to Santa Monica because everybody on the east side is like so far don't you know don't go to Santa Monica so far so far even though we knew the beach was here and then I came here for a weekend and hung out with a friend of mine and we rode bikes and soaked up the sun which it's always sunny here but and I thought my god I'm never leaving Santa Monica this is this is an oasis my body felt so restored Mm -hmm. and grounded here Mm -hmm. It blew all the other feelings away. It's just wild. And I think about that sort of thing. Like, what if I would waited another four years? Would have my eventuality of my soul brought me here? Or would I have taken another path? I don't know. I like having those little thought experiments. So I'm curious if you've ever thought about that. It's a very long-winded way to ask you the question. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, but it's, but it's, and it's beautiful to hear about, about your journey out here, too. And that's, and it's really, I think you speak to, you speak to following intuition, right? You had an intuitive, an intuitive hit. I'm meant to go live in Los Angeles. I'm going to go live in Los Angeles. And then things aligned to create that reality. Once I really meant it, because... Once you meant it, yes. Yeah. And that's, you know, sometimes we start by saying things and not really meaning them. Mm. 
and sometimes it's a practice of saying them while we don't really mean them that gets us to the point of meaning. And then there's a the moment you look at your fear and you think, I'm bigger than my fear and I can make this step. And then there's, and then there's that. And then there's, cause you're talking about the light voice and the shadow voice. And I can certainly say that a lot of my life was lived with the shadow voice. It was, it was, well, don't do that. That could be too big of a risk. Well, don't do that. That might upset someone. Well, don't do that. You're going to move again. Well, don't do that. That seems like it doesn't really jive with the other things that you're currently doing. There's, there's so many things. And then, and then there's, I'd say even, you know, the bigger, the bigger shadows, if you will, some of the more, not that those things that I just said aren't real, but, but the, don't do that. You're a failure. Don't (laughs) do that. You're embarrassing. Don't do that. You're insignificant. Don't do that. You don't matter. Don't do that. Nobody cares about you. Don't do that. You're not worth it. Don't do that. You're not lovable. These are the, these are the, when we want to get into the shadows, the shadows are those things that, that exist within us that, and, and, and they're voices that can be really loud. Really loud. Really loud. Because, because we've internalized, we've internalized them and we've, allo- and we've, when I say allowed, I don't mean allowed as opposed to something else, but they have had a chance to be really loud. They've had a chance to be really dominant and somewhere along the line, they they built walls that kept out the other messages and those walls just got really big and and so it becomes that 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 practice of like i said that little light thought comes and you're like yeah no and then it comes again yeah nope and then that happens a lot but but each each time it happens it's just it's like it's making a little dent in the giant shadow wall and each little dent, you know, you never know when you're going to just have that one hit and it cracks it all, it cracks it all down. And suddenly that, that voice of light or that voice of intuition or that voice that's, that's your truth is actually able to step up, jump into the driver's seat and actually take you somewhere. Mm-hmm. And, and it's, um, I'm, I'm just going to say it, it's a, it's a really, it can be a really challenging process and it can be a really <clears throat> daunting process. Yeah, it's the spoon digging a tunnel. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly. And, and I, I have this, you know, I, I say to people and the spoon made me think of this. I, I say, you know, sometimes we have these days, we're having these great days, you know, and we, we can show up and we can slay life with our giant sword. We've got this giant sword and you think of it, a giant sword can just, it can just, it can cut through any, it can cut through trees, it can cut through branches, it can cut through everything, you know, and you are just going and you're slaying and you've got this beautiful sword and everything's just, you know, you're cutting things down and the light is shining through because you're creating space and the light can come. And then you have other days and you've got like a broken number two pencil <laughs> and there is no pencil sharpener in sight because they don't have those anymore. And you and your broken number two pencil, and you are, you can barely take a step forward, and you're just kind of like poking that pencil at something, and you're just like poke, poke, poke. And that's what you've got that day. That's what you've got. That's what, you know, that's it. And those are the days that I've come to regard as the most beautiful days because when you show up and you don't have your big sword and you don't have, you feel like you don't have all these tools and you are just slugging through with your broken number two pencil. It's maybe got a little shard of a wood splinter to maybe make a dent somewhere, but I don't know. And, and you're still out there doing it and you're still out there trying to make that little, that little dent in your, in your own, um, in your own walls. You know, that's like, that's the, that's the love. That's the juice. That's the stuff that, that, that I think is the most spectacular because in a way when we get handed a whole bunch of tools it's easy but when you're trying to dig a tunnel with a spoon it is not easy and you just keep having to say to yourself you know one of these days or years or whatever it is I'm gonna get there and that that's I mean that's what it's like getting yourself out from big holes when you get into big holes that's what it feels like you know you're trying to you're just trying to it feels like you're trying to fight the tide but you just you just keep trying. You just keep spooning through your tunnel with your spoon. <laughs> and you've been here now in Los Angeles a year and a half. A year. A yeah, year. About a year. A little over a year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I and I very much sometimes feel like I'm digging the tunnel with a spoon. And some days I wake up and I'm like, all right, broken pencil it is. 
and, and other, some days you and have other days, <laughs> yeah and other days i've got the sword yeah, and everything's sure. great you know so that's 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 life right it goes in these it goes in these really interesting you know it can be day to day it can be waves sometimes it's just like weeks where you're like gosh this is amazing and then it just it shifts and it's not the sometimes we feel like we've done something that's easy to be, oh gosh, I must not be as positive as I should be right now. I must have lost my mojo. I must have, no, no, no. Life just goes in cycles and, you know, just keep showing up. It ebbs and flows. It's it a great flows. message from the ocean. It's, the, the ocean has, the, nature, we can, all, we can look to nature to get our most powerful lessons. The ocean, you know, the tides the phases of the moon. I mean, every two weeks, the moon is either full and releasing or it's new and filling up. So when it's full and releasing, what do we want to release? When it's a new moon and we're filling up, what do we want to fill ourselves or our lives with? And we can go and we can follow these cycles and we can use them and use them to, you know, to, to bring what we want into our lives. Not in a, not in a, you know, Oh, I'm just going to lay here and say, I'm rich, I'm rich, I'm rich. And then bags of money are going to fall from the sky. It's not, not quite like that, as Dang fun it. as that would be. <laughs> it's not quite like that. But, you know, we can, take, we can take those opportunities to at least give the light voice a chance to practice being heard. Yeah. You know, and, and, and wherever that start point is, it's, it's going to be a different start point for everybody. And it's going to look different for everybody. So... You know, working with people and coaching, like, I don't necessarily have one formulaic thing that people do. If you do this thing, then this will happen. It's not like that. Each person is going to need something a little different. Some, you know, different tools are going to resonate with different people. And people have, of course, different reasons for why they're there in the first place and why they're, they, they want some, some guidance in the first place. Um, I guess one thing that I would say that I that I do my best to follow is to create the space for people to figure things out themselves because it's always great when it comes from within and it's, it's always great when we're our own, you know, our own self efficacious leader. And to know that you're not abandoned by, by the, in that moment either. Right. You have support, you have support from someone and you have support from yourself. You have support from something or someone. I don't, there, it reminds me of... Have you read Screw Tape Letters, C.S. Lewis? Mm-mm. It's fantastic. And there's one section that gets me every time. And it's... So the, the premise of the story is uh, a demon uh, is, is, is training his nephew how to be a demon and how to take over human souls. And, of course, their big nemesis in all this is God. And obviously, C.S. Lewis was very much into these sort of things. And anyway, there's this one section, and Screwtape is telling Wormwood, his nephew, he says, you know, there'll be a moment where man thinks he's alone, and he's set out on the path, and he's walking on the path, and he's going to stumble, and he's going to fall, and he's going to have to pick himself up, and he's going to feel like he... I mean, they, they never use God's name because, you know, they're demons or whatever. It's like he has abandoned them and they're going to think that he's abandoned them. What they don't realize is he's walking beside them and letting them fall down, letting them make their own mistakes as any good parent would. Mm-hmm. And it, I remember the first time I read that section, and I'm not religious, you know, but that section, I cry every time I read it. That knowing that even in our the worst of us and we can judge ourselves more than anyone else will ever judge us we are so self-critical human beings that even in our worst moments there's still someone out there whether it's another person or whether it's the universe or whether it's just a sense of being that is that wants us to be okay that wants us to succeed that has our back that is with us and that we we forget that you know, in our darkest moment. I really, though, believe that whether you believe in science or God or angels or any of that stuff, nobody's alone. No, Mm -hmm. not a single one of us. No, we're not. I agree with you. One one, one thousand percent. We're not alone. And every time I meet somebody, like I met you, like I came into that classroom, you know, and I took the Pilates and I looked you in the eye and I thought, 
oh, this is another person that's been on some journeys, that's seen some fires. I remember I said to you, I was like, you know things, you've seen things. I could just tell. Yeah. And in that moment, I felt less alone. That's beautiful. And, you know, it, it speaks to, it speaks to the importance of human connection. Absolutely. Which we're losing, uh, pandemic aside, we're, we're losing that with technology, which has, as with anything, positives and, you know, or pros and cons. I, I, I really try to stay away from things like positives and negatives because I, I just, there's, there's so many ways to see things. Um, technology helps us in so many ways. So many ways. It also happens to isolate us in so many ways. Yeah. And one only has to look to a local bar or restaurant to see all of these people that are there together, but on their phones. Oh. Street. And I just, I see people. It makes people. me so sad. It makes me so sad too. I, I see couples, friends, groups, whatever, at a table together on their phones. I'm like, well, if you're here with someone, why not talk to them? I mean, if I was just going to be on my phone, I could go by myself, right? Mm. So I, I think that with that increasing, with the increasing amount of time that we interface with a screen, I think that there is more and more need for human connection, more and more need for those touch points where you get to look someone in the eye and go, you've lived You've walked through fires. I see it. I can see it in your eyes. I can feel it. Mm-hmm. It's life affirming. It's like there's, there's, I'm a human being and I'm living life. And that life goes in a lot of different directions. And there's a human being and I can, I feel like they're living life. And that life has gone in a lot of directions. And, and you, we need that. You know, when somebody has also been through some shit, you know? Yeah. And this is my challenge to anybody listening. And you don't have to do it all the time, but just pick one, one day, one night, go to dinner with your friends and leave your phone in your car during the dinner and just be, be there in the moment and, and see how that feels, you know, just see how be it feels. in the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Even, I mean, there's places here, if you go up into the canyons and stuff where there's no cell phone signal, like, oh my gosh, I can go on a hike for two hours and like no one can get to me. That's amazing. Feels yeah. good. I think there's probably lots of places in the country where there's no cell phone service. But you can um, uh, you can facilitate that for yourself too. And I'm not judging. I mean, I'm on my phone and stuff, but it does sure, feel good to be present. It does, and if and it also you know for you know not to not to get into too many health and wellness things because we could do that all night. Um, but it's really good. We know it's good to put your phone down. Let's call it an hour before you go to bed it's also really good not to pick your phone up for about an hour after you first start to wake up because you go through you go through your phases right your your brainwave phases right when as you're just as you want to slow yourself down from your day to go to sleep it's the same process on the way out i have an issue with that i definitely need to be better about that Oh, yeah, especially me too. too, because people will send you all sorts of horrible news. You know, you wake up first thing well, to tweets or to to texts that are like, "Oh my God, you see this terrible thing that happened?" And you're like, "Fuck, that's how I'm starting my day." Well, that and 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 our alarms are on our phone, so it tends to be. So, but but that aside, like you could turn off your alarm and then just not look at your phone, um, because because what happens is. You go and I don't remember the I, I read it, but I don't remember the exact order of of the of the brain waves you go through. But let's say you if if you're in theta and then you go to delta and then you go to beta and then you go to alpha, it might not be that order. But you're sleeping in theta and you're gonna get to alpha. If you turn on if you turn on your phone, you go through this abrupt shift from theta to alpha so quickly that you actually wire more stress into your day because you you know your cortisol levels have to spike. To, to start to respond to like what you just said, which is a bunch of doomsday texts that have arrived, you know, <laughs> on your phone or, or, or you start to look it's at the It's never news. a video of puppies. <laughs> Unless you have my Instagram feed and then it is videos of puppies because I only, I have, I have inspirational quotes and I have animal videos and I have cake and cookie decorating and I have crystals. Nice. And if you don't fit those categories, I'm not interested in having you on my Instagram feed. If it's going to be like, here's what's going on in the world. Nope, not in my feed. <laughs> so we have to also cultivate, I guess, to an extent, right? What it is that we 
um, what it is that we consume. But there is a lot of wisdom. I have found it. I've been trying to do it. And it, 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 can, it doesn't have to be like an hour from when you spring out of bed. I mean, if, you, if your alarm goes off at 730 and then you spend 20 minutes kind of laying there, pressing snooze a couple times, and then you get up and grab your coffee. Okay, you've already done a half an hour. And then you do a few other things. It's an hour from that moment that you wake up because you need that adjustment. So it's if, good advice. I if like people that. Can, yeah, it's just, you know, I, I just, I've been noticing it personally because I am also quick to, I, I like to do things um, like get rid of emails I don't need or make sure I've responded to texts. I like to do those kinds of things quickly. So I'll immediately be like, oh yeah, while I'm sleepy, still laying here and I don't want to move yet, why don't I just like bang out the That's inbox, I respond am. to the text, mm-hmm. get this done. Get... But it pulls me out of of a really relaxing state really quickly. So I've, I'm have i making that effort in my own life. Um, I'm going to commit to that too. Yay. Good. We've committed. High I five. I love it. High five. Boom. So we're committed, and maybe other people out there want to take this as an opportunity to start waking up. And, you know, it's a great opportunity to do a little meditation. It's a great opportunity to, I do, like, stretching and foam rolling. Um, It's a nice opportunity to listen to a few songs, listen to some songs that that bring you a sense of peace. It's a nice opportunity to sit and have some tea or coffee or whatever whatever it is you do. Write down your dreams. Write down your dreams. Create you know, create a little bit of a, of a morning ritual that sets up, that sets up the day. Mm. Um, you know, if you, if you like to make lists, I, I personally make like a gratitude list. I do that in the evening. You know, there's, there's so many things that we can do that involve just taking a little space for ourselves. It could be that you sit and breathe. I, I do that a lot. I sit and breathe. Like I actually just sit with my breath and I breathe. And sometimes my brain is already working really fast and sometimes it's quieter, and it's sort of the practice of allowing, allowing what is, allowing the thoughts to pass, and not judge them, or try to change them, or be mad at myself that I'm having so many thoughts during my quiet breathing time. You know, that's most of the practice of, of meditation or breathing, is, is just rela- it's, it's releasing the judgment on oneself that we're not doing it the right way. And the good news is the world will keep going without you for 15 minutes. It's it not sure gonna, will. It's not going to, nobody's going to lose any sleep on if you don't return a phone call for a few minutes. No. Unless and it's a bona fide emergency, then of course, obviously. But we're not talking about emergencies. Yeah. We're just talking, you just know, as far as regular daily, day-to-day. yeah. No, everything's going to be fine. Everything's going to be fine. And, you know, for that matter, when people aren't feeling well or have something really going on in life, Everything's going to be okay if you need to tap out for a week or for a month for that matter. Like work is going to be fine. They will understand. People are going to be fine. They will understand. And, and I, I have to work with myself on this too in terms of that fast response time that I always like to, you mm-hmm. know, adhere to. But it's okay to honor oneself and to honor one's needs and to honor one's wants and to listen to the body and to listen to the heart and to not always feel like life is being lived for the sake of responding to someone else's whatever it is. Because people are always going to shoot you a text, shoot you an email, call you, whatever it is, at a time that might not be good for you. They don't know that. But it's this feeling like we have to always respond immediately. And almost like people expect the immediate response. I mean, it's just stressing us all out. It stresses me out sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I just have to step back and say, whoa. And also to know that if somebody doesn't get back to you right away, that that's also okay. That that's also okay. To breathe through that. Yeah. Because that, you don't know what's going on on their end. We, we, We don't know what's going on for someone. And how many times have we all, so we've all done it, myself, I'm sure you, you text someone and you're like, oh my God, they haven't gotten back to me in they 15 hate minutes. Me. They hate me. <laughs> yeah. And it's just like, God, they they don't hate you. They're busy. <laughs> or whatever. Or they're trying to not be attached to their phones all the time. But it doesn't she have would, anything to do with you. No, of course not. You know? And so, and that, and that goes to um, a really wonderful book. I think I mentioned it um, p- possibly on the last one, but it's called The Four Agreements. It's yeah, it's an a great old, book. old book. But The Four Agreements are, they're very simple. Um, not, not necessarily easy to do, but the agreements themselves are simple. 
the four agreements are as follows. One most, I think, pertaining to what we were just talking about, which is, well, two, which, which are, one, don't make assumptions, never assume, don't make assumptions, and two, don't take things personally, right? So those two pertain to the communications, right? Don't assume that somebody's got something going on, da, 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 they, they, you know, they hate you or whatever, and don't take personally that they haven't gotten back to you in a certain length of time. And then the other ones are um, be, impeccable. be impeccable with your word, mm -hmm. be impeccable with your word, and always do your best. Mm -hmm. And always do your best back to the whether you have a giant sword or the tiny broken pencil. Either way, you're doing your best. You're doing your best with what you've got at the moment. Just try to do your best with what you have at the moment. Be impeccable with, with your word. You know, words, I, we think of that, I think often, or I thought of it as, what am I saying to people? How am I coming across? But being impeccable with your word has to do with that, but also what words are we saying to ourselves? Those are the words we most hear, right? The words we most hear are the words that we say to ourselves, the thoughts we have towards ourselves. And that is also very much the meaning of that, right? To be impeccable with your word is, is to be, you know, be thoughtful about how you talk to yourself. I, that's probably one of my biggest ones. Like one of my biggest, um, not obstacles, but one of, one of the biggest, you know, things that I get to contend with in life is that over the years, I developed a pretty, pretty harsh inner voice. I, uh, you know, judgmental towards me harsh towards me, highly critical towards me, cr critical of what I'm doing, critical of what I'm saying, very critical of how I look. I mean, there, there are things that, that I developed and I have to be pretty vigilant and pretty on top of the way that those voices run. There's all the obvious things, right? The obvious ways that I might talk to myself that are just self-deprecating in a very apparent way. But there's a lot of little things that when you start to tune in, I'm just like, oh my gosh, wow, you have a lot of stuff that you throw at yourself. A lot of stuff that you're left to field. That you would never say to another person. That you person. would never say to another person. Mm -hmm. That you don't think about, like you don't think about that, you know, with respect to other human beings. Why are you thinking about that with respect to yourself? Yeah. So that's that's a really interesting process to engage in. Is, Excellent is book. One's own self talk. Yeah. So yes, the Four Agreements highly recommend. There are other books by the same author, but that's a great place to start, and it's a quick read. It is quick, yeah. and every time I reread that book, I discover a different passage, which is weird because I've read it so many times. And, yeah. And I think, how have I not? How do I not remember that line before? I've never read that line before, even though I've read it a million times. It just didn't speak in the moment to me. And that's the beautiful thing about about rereading things is that you get a really different message each time. Mm -hmm. You know, in in Judaism, the conversation is, oh, we read we read the Torah every year. Like every year, we read this Torah portion again and again and again. This week, that week, this. Why do we Why do we do this all the time? Why do we repeat this stuff all the time? Well, there's a number of answers, and I'm sure many more than I can even think of, but one is that you get something you get something different out of it because you're a different person each time you read that. You know, so there's always something new to learn. Yeah. There's always something new to learn. Amen to that. Yeah. Yeah. So Rachel, you're awesome. Thanks. I feel like we could probably do a part three one of these days as well. We could do a part three. I I um We'd have to we'd have to figure out what we want to have. That You're gonna have to start your about. own podcast and just have me on it. That would, <laughs> that would be that would be really cool. That I have I have some ideas for for podcasts, so we could certainly talk about that. You should you should start one. There's you know what there's not enough podcasts in the world. Well, I was gonna say, <laughs> and and you know what I, I will I will go ahead and say that one of my own limiting beliefs that is another thing that I work with is is this is a com this conversation is a perfect example. You, you should start a podcast. Oh, there's so many podcasts yeah, out there. Who wants my podcast? But and yours I think is different. It, sure, sure. But that's, that's a, I thought that was a perfect example yeah. to share a limiting belief that I think a lot of people could relate to. I do that with my, with my fitness nutrition. Like people, you, you should make Pilates, you know, videos and post the, oh, post it on thing. Instagram or well, gosh, you should, you, you do all this beautiful cooking. Take, take pictures of the food and post a recipe. And like so many people are posting food photos. Nobody wants my food photos. So many people are doing Pilates. Nobody wants my, but you know what? Everybody's just doing it. I, okay. I'm me. It's original. Cause it's me. That's exactly right. 
And and that's that's something that I need to work on to lose. True, true. And honestly, the self discovery. This is one of the, the greatest benefits of having a podcast. I have learned so much about myself by talking with other people. It's been fantastic. And the bonus is I learned so much about other people. Yeah, it's got to be it's got to be fascinating. It's wonderful you know, getting a chance to really sit down with people, it's learn wonderful. about them. Yeah. And, you know, so yeah, it's um it's it's an interesting journey of going from, you know, where we are to where we find ourselves with so much, you know, hope and and desire to see where that goes. I'm certainly very excited to see how things continue to unfold. Whether I remain in LA or not, I have no idea. I have no idea. There was this moment when I was moving out here and this this little this little voice was like, You're gonna move out to LA just to come back out this way. And I was like, No. And I spent about thirty seconds being like, Okay, how do I how do I circumvent the next X years and just be back here already? Right? Like, how do I not have to go through this? Uh nope, you gotta go through it. Every step you take is part of that next step, right? It's part of that. To come, even if I do end up back on the East Coast or towards the East Coast or somewhere in the middle, coming here was, of course, an extremely necessary step to ending up back there. That's right. And the good news is, whether you walk forward, backward, to the left or to the right, or diagonally, it doesn't make it, it doesn't matter. It's all your story and you're entitled to it. Exactly. And a lot of times... Most of the time, pretty much all the time, life is just an incredible array of zigzags and spirals and messy little doodles that you cannot begin to decipher. It, it reminds me of sometimes you see, you see those, um, or I see those photos where it's like what we think healing is going to look like. And it's just like a person sitting there meditating what healing actually looks like. And it's a pie chart with like mm. being on the floor, crying my eyes out, taking two steps back. It's, there's a little slice for the meditating. There's a, there's a little, there's a little nod to the meditating and, you know, all these different acknowledgements of the truth, which is, you know, yeah, the, the having to deal with real life. Life is messy. Life is messy. Yeah. Life is messy. And if you're, if you're a, you know, clean, neat, orderly semi-OCD person, the messiness of life can take some getting used to. Yeah. It's taken me some time to get used to it. Yeah. Um, but it's exciting to, to release the reins a little bit mm. and be able to, to sit back and go, okay, life is messy, so I can either fight it or I can just jump in and be with it. You know, so, so that's, I mean, that's, that's a, that's a great lesson from, from medicine work. And, you know, things that come, whether it's, whether it's, you know, ayahuasca or any one of the other entheogenic substances, um, whether it comes from there or whether it doesn't come from there, for some people trying or looking to, to medicine work is going to be, be the answer. For many people, that's not the answer. That is definitely not the only way in to, mm. to, um, moving forward in a meaningful way. That's not the only way to work with addiction. That's not the only way to work with PTSD or depression. There, there are so many ways that also might not necessarily have to involve just traditional being medicated by Western drugs. And by the way, sometimes those, but sometimes those are also necessary and, and, and extremely helpful, you know, as long as, um, as long as, you know, that's been determined. Um, I would never, I would never tell someone, oh, just, you know, don't take medication. That's because for some people, that's exactly the right thing to do. Uh, we just, I, I, I am concerned based on my own personal experience and general statistics in the world and general trends in the world that we, at least in, in the United States, are very quick to medicate as opposed to using the many other tools and remedies and solutions and ideas and trajectories at our disposal. And that's, that's the thing that I find, um, you know, worthy of caution. Not that, not that there's some strict don't do this or do this, medication bad, non-medication good, not at all. But just how quick we are, how quick our society is to be like, oh, you have a problem? Yeah, take this. 
you know, and we're just addressing symptoms and we're not addressing causes. And Band-aids for bullet holes. Band-aids for bullet holes. And it's tough. It and it's tough. tough because people have a lot of bullet holes these mm-hmm. days, you know. And we, we, we can't keep putting Band-aids on bullet holes because at the end of the day, we're not stopping the bleeding and people are bleeding out. That's right. Tell people again uh, how to find you. Yes, you can find me on, on Instagram. It's just at Rachel Retman, R-A-C-H-E-L-R-E-T-T-M-A-N. Uh, same thing on Facebook, just Rachel Retman. And then my website, also rachelretman.com. Dot com. And I'll put links on yeah, the Yeah, you'll put podcast. links and yeah. we can uh, yeah, put other, we'll, we'll put some other links from things that we've talked about. Heck yeah. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you for listening, everyone. Stay well, stay safe, stay happy. That's a lot to ask for. Stay safe. (laughs) Stay safe, and may we all feel loved. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Rate and review Hey Human on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks. Bye.